Well, hello there. Welcome back to the uh, to the lockdown show, otherwise known as a fine kettle of fish. So, um, uh, it's a kettle of stinky fish. Okay, this is Franz Cantor here, cartoonist, illustrator, tune talker, teacher, tinker tailor, spy, all of the above. Um, all right, we're doing another drawing. Doing another caricature, I like caricatures because they explore, they give me a chance to explore the face, which is my hobby, my passion, drawing people. I like people very much. Don't listen to the rumors. Um, I'm not mean to people. So um, what we're going to do today is, um, let's see, uh, I've lost my spot, as I normally do. Okay, so we're going to do Don Adams. Now, I'll explain to you why uh, in a sec. Um, I just want to go through this. Don Adams, if you don't know, is, of course, uh, Agent, Eight Agent 86 Get Smart. And he um, <clears throat> was born in 1923, died in uh, 2005 at the age of 82. So he never made 86. Would have been great to make 86, but he didn't do it. It's a terrible shame. Another four years. So um, he played Maxwell Smart, Agent Eighty Six in Get Smart, and he had uh, he was he had apparently had problems with being typecast because he created this iconic character voice on I think it was the Bill Dana show, and he used it for like t types of people like public servants or or uh, you know. Um, government employees or something so when they did the Don Adams screen test for the show for um, Get Smart of course he just he just put in that voice and um, it was sort of like his best asset but was immediately a hit so um, yeah there you go so he's also the voice of course of um, Inspector Gadget and a cartoon that I actually love, 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 love the cartoon is um, um, Tennessee Tuxedo. So we're going to have a talk about uh, his work. Of course, this is the, the shot to end all shots. This is, of course, the shoe phone. So the show Get Smart was written by two very funny people. Mel Brooks, who I've done a, a caricature of before and Buck Henry and it was a spy spoof so there was a whole lot of stuff I want to just explain this to you when I was a kid I was too young to see James Bond because they were violent you know films serious films but I could see the takeoffs of James Bond on TV like Matt Helm and um, the um, Coburn one which I can't remember for a second but, and plus there was a lot of others, there were Italian takeoff films, there were Japanese takeoff films of the spy genre. So it was a very big thing. And on TV, of course, we had The Man from Uncle, um, Napoleon Solo, and um, The Girl from Uncle, April Dancer. And uh, we had things like Wild Wild West, um, which was uh, a, a spy drama set in the post-Civil War era of America so under uh, President Lincoln 1880s 1870s or something whatever it was and there was Get Smart now Get Smart was a spoof on a lot of things of the spy era film noir um, it was very very well written incredibly well written the timing of Don Adams was amazing it was sort of like a legendary um relationship uh, a marriage made in heaven type of thing you know the perfect storm whatever you want to describe it he exemplified this bumbling detective so well there have been bumbling detective films and bumbling detective shows etc but this was like like none other 
This is him towards the end of his life uh, with his co-star from the show, Barbara Feldon. Um, this is uh, Edward Platt, who was the chief in 99 and, uh, and Don. So they had a lot of fun with this. They, they really enjoyed the show. This, this is like a take on, you know, microfish, microfilms. Sp a lot of the spy elements, you know, they, they just sort of like the... the um, like the shoe phone, you know. There's no such thing as a shoe phone. But <laughs> just all of these gizmos, you know, like Q creating this stuff for James Bond. This is this is what it was like. This is really, it was a really funny, clever show. And he had this beautiful range of innocence and, um, and matter-of-fact type of personality. It's Barbara... He had, you know, other characters they brought on the show, like Jaime, which was a favorite of mine, was a robot, and Fang. So Fang was like the spy dog. So it was just, it was so much fun. And the reason, this is, this is the, the photograph I'm going to be working the caricature from today, which is a screen grab. It's a bit blurry. It's a screen grab from, a t from the TV. The patter between these two... Um, 86 and the chief, especially around things like secrets where they would employ um, things like the the dome of, what was it, the dome of silence, which was his perspex um, cone that sort of came down, the cone of silence came down over their desk, which was incredibly funny. This is, uh, um, well, I know that's Starker and and um, Siegfried and of course they were Chaos which is sort of like the, the Get Smart version of Thrush or um, um, uh, I forget the James Bond one but uh, they were very funny you know and they had a, the, they employed all of these great uh, that's um, Claw the Claw so they employed a lot of great character actors and they missed it by that much. It's like, you know, actually that, you could say that. If I don't get the caricature, you could actually say that today. Uh, missed it by that much. It was just such a lovely show. And I, you know, when it first came on TV, I didn't really uh, understand it. I didn't really get it. I didn't really enjoy it. But it went into reruns and it was on every single afternoon for years, the whole of the 70s was like, and part of the 80s probably. It was on TV constantly, every single day. It was so big here in Australia. Just such a lovely uh, personality, you know, really funny. And of course, there's Napoleon Solo from Robert Vaughan from um, Mad From Uncle. So that was a sort of, uh, at the same time, you know, they were... <laughs> They were, it was a spy drama show. There was a serious one, and this is a takeoff. So they were obviously, you know, not short of uh, material. Some of his expressions were, like, iconic. And, of course, you know, that whole thing of the spy came to, you know, play the, um, uh, uh, play into the hands of uh, um, DIC Animation, to, of course, to create the Inspector Gadget uh, franchise. Which again, I never really watched. Uh, I never saw this. It was on it, like a, on the ABC on a certain time. This is a beautiful uh, poster by Jack Davis for the um, TV. I think it's for the TV show because it's got Fang in it. I don't know if it was a film. It may have been a film. Uh, Get smart. I'm not sure. I'll have to do more research, won't I? This is one of my favourite cartoon shows. Um, Never liked it at first, you know, because I, I didn't understand. I did not understand the simplicity of the storyline of this uh, uh, penguins trying to get out of the zoo. Does that sound familiar? Okay, that story sounds familiar, right? Well, this was done in the 70s or the early, uh, late 60s. So Tennessee Tuxedo and Chumley. Chumley's the, uh, his buddy was a... a, a a walrus. 
and uh, he had that iconic uh, Maxwell smart voice. So um, that was uh, Don Adams' role, I think, to replicate more, more and more Maxwell smart. So let's start drawing. I've done a little uh, thumbnail, and I'm just trying to work out um, some some shape that I can play with here. So what I've got from the TV show, I've kind of got this sort of plectrum shape, right? And um, it, it's also for a three-dimensional drawing, of course, we've got to talk about lights. Where is the light coming from? The light is coming from the left. There's also a fill light coming in from the right. So the fill light breaks up the shadow a little bit. Okay, so that you get a rim of highlight and the shadow area will be towards the, the right hand side of the object of the face. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to think about that while we draw. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was, of course, this is a caricature and our recognition fact is based on a relationship between the the eyes the nose and the mouth so I like to think of it in a sort of a t-zone or a mask area the mask area of the face is where we're going to start to concentrate our effort on the details and building a relationship a dialogue if you will between these elements now, what do I mean by that? Okay, there's more to it than, obviously, than um, proportions, relative proportions. So, proportions give you the correct placement and size and scale uh, and shape of elements of the face. But what we're doing with the caricatures is we're exaggerating those proportions. But all of these elements have to be related to one another. Okay. So they have to be placed in a way that makes sense. So we look for ways to make sense. So this could be, you know, uh, the concept of rhythm, where lines kind of join up to each other, okay, to sort of give you a sense of um, continuity, of rhythm. These are musical terms, I realize that. But, uh, you know, in drawing, it's often uh, valuable to think of uh, ways of explaining the process itself that is more memorable and applicable. Okay, so this is, we've got this plectrum shape and I've taken the opportunity to draw it a little bit. I think I've probably gone a little bit tight with the, with the drawing. So I've lost some of the expanded shape here, but I kind of realize this sort of uh, expression from the photograph kind of gives me an impression that he's sort of talking a little bit out of the side of his mouth just a little bit so that might be helpful also to to note is the relationship between the eyes and the nose um, which are giving it uh, quite making the eyes look quite small in the face so that's something that we need to think about while we draw let's have fun here we go all right, so I'm using some uh, brown pencils. This is a, uh, a Rembrandt, a Lyra, and uh, it's a waxy pencil. I'll also be using a white pencil and a black pencil. So the black pencil is a polychromo. It's a nice waxy, harder. It's a sort of a medium, I think, hard um, pencil. Also, we've got uh, some white pencils. So we're going to be using that as well. This is a, quite a soft, uh, let's get a, a pencil extender over here. These are uh, um, Prismacolors. They're very, very soft pencils. And they have a tendency to break. So you've got to be kind of careful when you're sharpening them. Sometimes I, th I get the impression, you know, that they pack them pre-broken. <laughs> so that, you, you, ne you, you know, you get down to the, the stubs quite quickly. This is a pencil extender because you need, they're quite expensive pencils, about $3 each in Australia. So you need to get as much value out of them 
as you can. All right, so this is a, a Rembrandt. This is a red, is it like a terracotta. It's a warm brown. So let's try to get some details in here, even though the, the photograph is really quite fuzzy. <laughs> but, you know, thankfully we've got a, uh, an idea of what should be there. So um, we have an idea according to the, 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 the powers of anatomy, <laughs> the powers of anatomy, the, um, the, um, concept of anatomy, which is the, you know, realistic drawing, uh, placement of, uh, of anatomical features, realistic or lifelike ability to draw um, the human body and parts of so it could be the hands it could be the face they're all part of uh, anatomy isn't it so don't believe me here we go so see this these two things here are close to the skin usually in the human face so is the forehead so if you were to allude to these, even though you may not see them in the photograph, if you were to allude to the positioning of these sharp objects close to the skin, it tends to give the drawing more believability. Okay, so let's just put them in now. There you go. Now the forehead's quite tight anyway, so we're, we're, we're pretty safe, I think, with that. It's got very few lines here. It's a very manicured um, spy. Uh, what am I doing here with this? Let's get some light in this out a little bit. Just a, just a black rubber, Faber-Castell black rubber. It tends to leave less um, smudges than the white rubber. Go figure. Uh, would never have thought that, but that's how it works. Okay, um, now hair is great because you can draw hair beautifully with a pencil, like so, and it looks hairy. Looks, you know, luckily um, the two things refer to each other quite well. Hair looks like pencil lines, pencil lines looks like hair. So, um, first time round, I missed a lot of the Get Smart stuff um, a lot of the shows I just missed it and um, I think actually I would have come at the second round of um, repeats of Get Smart and as I said in the 70s of course it was just repeated uh, all the time just constantly so um, I got to love uh, Don Adams and I got to love the show and the sense of humor, you know, and I would have uh, been very aware of um, Mel Brooks because his name's plastered all over the show. And Buck Henry, of course, um, who was the other co-writer. Let's try to get some nice um, variants in the shapes here because I think I'm, I'm, I'm convinced here I've done I've erred on the side of uh, normality in terms of proportion. I could have gone a little bit further with this. So um, it's uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting ah um, oh, he's got a big earlobes. That's what that shape is. Even though it's um, blurry, I can get a feeling of some of what's in the blurred shapes, what are the details that I should be uh, interested in. So, um, yeah, the, the spy drama, of course, you know, was all over it, even though I didn't get to see any James Bond films till much, much later uh, in reruns and things on TV. But I was really into... Um, the the spy films this you know Matt Helm and um, and obviously um, Man from Uncle 
So this is a spoof show, and um, because the, the, the genre was so hot, was so in the moment, um, it just became so powerful in, you know, I mean, you couldn't, it was, it was so cleverly written, it was so funny and up to date. Um, and of course, you know, some of the humor is very sort of what you call Yiddish based humor. Uh, Yiddish based humor is sort of like, uh, it can be observational humor, you know, observing rhythms and words that uh, sound funny out of context and things like that. So it's just looking from an immigra immigrant perspective. Um, a mirror on society that was funny because when you took the time to look at a lot of the things we take for granted um, figures of speech etc it was funny out of con out of in, in a fresh context in a fresh set of uh, eyes so that's what Yiddish humor provided so a lot of the the humor was Yiddish based. I didn't speak Yiddish. My father did. So I didn't have any understanding of a lot of the words, what they meant. But you kind of figure it out by their usage and and inflection, sort of something. Like if someone was to say schmuck, you understand roughly what it means, right? It means you're a dick. <laughs> But um, you understand it by probably by the volume and the inflection of it. Schmuck. So it just sounds like that's what it would be. So I call Yiddish the, the, the sort of the Jewish art of self-defense because a lot of the times it's used for um, f funny observations, but it could be used for in insults. You know, hidden in insults, insults that someone's insulting you without, uh, you know, <clears throat> without using, without using the words that you're familiar with. So there, <clears throat> it's kind of like a secret language of humour, because it's it has its base in rhythm, and uh, a lot of the rhythm is funny. Uh, when my father was. <clears throat> talking to his brothers they would be laughing so I got the impression that Yiddish is like a very uh, funny language it's not Hebrew, it's not German it's something new, you know, it's a different take on the world and whenever I saw it in use in like Mad Magazine for example or um, Foghorn Leghorn, you know, Bugs Bunny show that sort of thing um, I was it, it was it was fascinating to me. It was really interesting. So he's got very he's got hazel eyes, but I think with because of the shading here, um, we need to have them quite dark. So I think because uh, it was fairly new, you know, the spy genre um, at that time in the 60s, it became very, very popular, this show, very, very quickly. So we're going to be here for a while because it's, uh, it's simpler than it looks. No. It's harder than it looks. And it was one or the other. Okay, so... Missed it by that much. So we had a lot of, uh, you know, particular sayings and things, you know. Sorry about that, Chief. So it was, you know, whenever something would go wrong. And the idea is that he's a bungling uh, spy. So... You know, um, everything that could go wrong would go wrong. 
this sort of the get smart you know thing and even the words the name of the show get smart it's like you know get Carter get get that guy <laughs> get that guy after him so it was um, it, you, you could get an idea of, of basically what it was about and I don't know if they ever said get smart as a name drop in the actual show itself um, I can't remember if they ever did that but um, you know just the rhythm that this guy had in in that voice the character that he created he created a character for stand-up comedy and it it just took over um, you know so it became like a your typecasting, I guess, is is a, is a problem, but when you have a character that is just so powerful and universally adored, like Maxwell Smart, then you know it's kind of a it's a bit hard to hate the typecast, if that makes sense. I'm trying to what I'm trying to do is match the scale scale left and right um, equally so there's a few things that I'm, you know I want to bring the eyes closer together I think that's important make the eyes sm smaller I think that's important um, so I might uh, I'm having a few issues with this for sure, but we'll see. We'll keep going, you know. You never know. You never know. But I'm enjoying it anyway because, you know, it was just such an important part of my life. Um, I was driving here today thinking, you know, what am I going to do? He looks very Putinish, doesn't he? The shape of the head and the size of the eyes and the scale of the nose. I might just, um, you know, I think I've, because of the proportions are more regular than I would have anticipated, I might just um, move the eyes a little bit. So what I'm trying to do here, this, this as I said to you before, the relationship between these elements, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, are very important. There's a lot of things happening, like lining things up, right, in terms of their their um, their perspective. Yep. Now his head is a little bit tilted, so we have to be careful. I would presume that both eyes are same size relatively so we're lining these up with different connectors different rhythm or um, uh, what would you call landmarks yeah so the geography of the face are uh, dependent on the landmarks that we establish the landmarks have to have some sort of sense uh, okay there's a bit of pinching down into the lid itself some push pushing down so that is actually something that we might need to repair so I've got a sharper it's an electric eraser it's a little bit better. I might try this one as well. So what I'm looking for is, again, it's the problem with the blurred photograph. I'm looking for a way of um, an easier task of finding the likeness, but I'm, I'm looking for the right landmarks here. 
and uh, that's why I moved the eye. And um, might be a little bit easier over here. Yeah, it's a little bit better. It looks a little bit less Putinesque. Putinesque. Is that a word? Put I just made up a word. Putinish. No, Putinesque. Hang on. That doesn't. That sounds like a rude word. Okay, be be careful. One man's Putin is another man's something else, you know. So I think Putin is a is a very interesting character. There's been lots of caricatures of Putin, so I don't want to add to that. Plus, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not really a political cartoonist. I, um, I, <laughs> I've paid my dues. That's my answer. I paid my dues. I've done my 20, 30. John Howard's enough was enough. You know. So, um, oh, some, some fine lines over here too. Okay, cool. So I've got like a, a light happening over on this side of the face, which um, is kind of nice. I might try to play that up a little bit more, I think. Let's see what I can do with that. So the brown pencil um, is tonally closer to the gray paper. So I'm using gray paper because I want to use a white pencil to build up a sculptural drawing. What I mean by sculptural is it's you're drawing light as well as shadow. So normally on a on a like a white piece of paper, you have to draw in the half tones and the and and the darker shadows and things, and everything that is light, of course, is white paper. So um, must adhere. There's a bit of uh, anatomy, but you basically must adhere to the the impression you get of the lines and their dominant, you know, sh um, characteristic. So that could be counter to the details. It could be the opposite of the details. So you need to uh, put details in relevant to how your impression of the face is going. So the bottom layer of teeth showing from this angle. That'll do. Yeah, that's fine, I think so. What else is happening with the nose here? So I'm going to build up a light. Up. I'm trying to anticipate where I'm going to be putting the white pencil to build up the uh, the lights, the highlights, and the shine, etc. So I am thinking about the future, where I'm going to go with this. Okay. All right. Let's let's see. How are we going over on this side? I think we're going to have a, a little rim light happening on that side of the face. It'd be kind of nice. Um, the shadow of the nose. I'm going to push a little bit down towards that side too, which will compensate for that um, shine, that reflection on the right. Um, I'm playing with the perspective a little bit on the jaw making it twist and turn sort of like this sort of effect a little bit just a bit just to try to get some um, interesting rhythms interesting rhythms so you know I could put things in and then decide 
whether on how they're relevant to the to the face later on. So c classical balloon head type caricatures, you've got big head, little body. But in the body, I want to make some sort of sense. In other words, look at what the somewhat, you know, what the characteristic of the uh, the tie and the 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 rest of the um, accoutrement is happening. You know, so it's like trying to get a little bit, not too much detail, but maybe a little bit of character into the uh, the clothing as well. Always keep an eye on the suit style, make sure that it is, you know, very true to the to the character and think about perspective, of course. These are things, it's not like a shopping list, but it's something you, you work on as you go. Okay, that'll do for that. What are we happening over here? We need to match the perspective of that. Of course, doing the shoe phone. Let's go back to a shoe phone. All right, here we go. So that's the speaker. The, the heel's taken off, so it's just the flat of the sole. Then there's a dial over here with a flip. We'll do. Um, then we'll put some cartoony stubby fingers. Cheating a little bit with the, the suit, it's fine. It would be a bit more accurate if I had a sleeve or something. But um, I think a certain amount of stylization helps the the caricature from getting too stale. So it starts to lose a lot of the more realistic it becomes the tighter the movements are so it's sort of like saying to a ballet dancer I want you to do a beautiful pirouette but you, you must do it only do it in in this phone box so you, you kind of mm, limited your uh, your your movements it's the same thing with with you know, caricature, the tighter it becomes to, to more realistic, the, the less invention, inventiveness, the less inventiveness. So his eyes are quite dark in most of them. This is hazelnut, hazelnut in color, hazel, hazelnut, hazel in color, but um, it's actually quite dark in lighting. So... That's relevant. That's relevant because, um, and there's a little bit of pinching from the lower lid on this expression too. So it's a bit of, especially on that side. Okay, I think we're okay with that. So I'm trying to make the eyes darker. I wonder if we filled them in, what would happen? Yeah, that's okay. Don't worry about the highlight. I've got a paint pen to the rescue. It's white. It doesn't interact with the pencil, so we'll be able to get it back in the right contrast. So, there's also a lot of makeup in this um, shot as well. From that era, they, they wore a lot of um, smoothing type of makeup, television. 
an early film. I think it was shot and filmed, but it was shot and filmed for TV. So it would be very... Um, you would see makeup in photographs of that era. And, you know, probably mascara sometimes. Some of them would have like an eyeliner a little bit just to accentuate the, um, the lines a bit more. Let's try to get that shadow back. Something that makes a bit more sense. There you go. So noses are really interesting. I've actually drawn this nose in perspective, more perspective than the photograph, because I need it to break through a lot of the um, the shapes, a lot of the other ge the other geometry. I need it to be more prominent. But you know, drama in terms of drama, contrast, contrast. So dramatic elements in the story of the face that you're drawing. So those um, relevant uh, elements are contrasts. We'll help this out a little bit with a black brush. Try to get a little bit more, help the contrast even more. So he has got hazel eyes, but I think the general impression is that they're very, very dark because of the lighting. And of course, his eyebrows are filled in with makeup too, so it's got a very softer, blended effect which is designed to f um, hide a lot of details and blemishes and things like that, wrinkles, whatever. Um, but it's, it, it's a task to read because you've got to try to, you've got to read it. So see what I mean with the, the eyes, right? I'm trying to get this level of believability, of realism, of truth, so I'm thinking about the geometry, the actual anatomy of the eyes, the texture of the skin, the, the, the eyebrows, etc. And having an appropriate response. And of course, thinking about the overall le level of light and dark. So what is it? What is the appropriate uh, response to turn something that is photographic into a line um, and tone drawing and anticipating the the use of the white uh, pencil on the top so don't um, you know be careful about how much pencil you put on that area because um, that might have some bearing on the effectiveness of the of the highlights later on I think, uh, you know, this is quite nice, this light area, even though it's not in the photograph. I've got this sort of um, this shading here. Let me just correct this. Okay, so what I've got here happening is something that happened by accident. So go back to the plectrum shape, right? So imagine that I'm going to leave a line on the right-hand side opposite the light source, which is going to be a light fill, which is a rim light or a backlight or whatever it is. So you've got the shading like this, but you've also got an establishment of another rim light over on the left hand side, which means that this overall light spill in the center has an even lighter element on this side. Okay, so there is like giving it a very dimensional approach. So form is created by the presence of light and shadow. So when we're playing with light and shadow, like we are here, we're creating a, a, a story of the form, of, of 
how the form is created or how these forms are depicted or um, shown off with the, with the light and the presence of the shadow. So if you have multiple lights, it's important to keep um, aware, keep aware of where the shadows should be when you put in shadows. Don't overcomplicate the effect of light, right? Except with the with the presence of the shine, the presence of the illuminated part of the object. So the shadows should always favor one direction as much as you can. Otherwise, you're creating a, a complex drawing and it changes the, the, the narrative a little bit. The more complex the lighting is in the drawing, um, the more confusing those elements are. Um, okay, all right, I think we're okay. Oh, see, be careful with, you know, be careful with a lot of this um, tone put in there. All right, so some areas it's fine, other areas not so fine. Let's continue on. got this incredible um, use of the lower lower mouth you know a lot of energy is in the mouth intensity up here with the eyes focus incredibly focused comedian um, but a lot of the intensity in the expression is paled in comparison to the intensity around his mouth so this is a guy that really is good at what he does he's really good at talking and if you're an actor or a comedian especially stand up comedian you know a character actor character comedian these are characterizations that carry your your jokes make them work better um, they give it Narrative, they give the narrative more context and richness. We love hearing, like, when a character is, is very rich in terms of their, their uh, details, it makes it more um, exciting and more believable. All right, so I'm going to get some help here. I don't want to draw, um, smudge everything. I need to get over here on the left-hand side, so you're not going to see a lot of drawing at the moment because I'm hiding it with the paper. So just bear with me for a few minutes. Let's talk more about his effects. So the reason why I'm doing this is because today we've had this incredible um, series of unfortunate events in Melbourne. And um, and it's getting me down, and I won't lie to you. And today's subject is a way of trying to get my mojo back, trying to get be happy again. And um, so, you know, I'm entertaining myself. I'm being selfish. <laughs> I love, I just love him. I think he's fantastic. Um, you know, it's it's like uh, I'm probably going to go and binge watch Get Smart when I get home. So um, I just think he's so clever, uh, and just the combination, the perfect storm of Buck Henry and Mel Mel Brooks, um, and his wonderful character that he created and decided to use for the show. It just worked so well. You know. And if you ever get a chance to 
YouTube um, Tennessee Tuxedo, you'll uh, enjoy that just as much, I think. I never really watched um, Inspector Gadget, as I said. Wowzers! So, I don't know the... the expressions that he had. But this show, um, Get Smart, was just full of um, tropes, spy tropes, send-ups of he did a he did a show where he was he did this sort of Bogart impression. Um, he's looking at you, kid. This is full full on cultural pop icon pop culture tropes. You know, the shoe phone is another one, even though there's never been a shoe phone, but it's a reference to the gadgets of spies. You know that we we love to see in James Bond with Q. You know the pen that has poison gas in it or something. And um, it's like a, I'm a big fan also of um, Leslie Nielsen in um, Police Squad. So you know um, Naked Gun. Same thing. It's, it's sort of that abs you know absurd humor from from the genre you should do Leslie Nielsen of course he uh, he played a lot of serious roles he was in um, Forbidden Planet Leslie Nielsen. You can tell I, I have a very narrow um, cultural experience, when it comes, especially with, with film. A very narrow experience. Is it funny? Yes. Is, it, is there a horror? Yes. Is there a monster? Yes. Okay, I'm in. Um, I've never seen a Bette Davis film. How's that? That kind of tells you, you know. My sister's a big Betty Davis fan. Um, I had to do a, a sketch, a pencil sketch for her, for my sister to give to her on the Opera House stage, I think it was, from memory, when she visited Australia. So, um, I, w I was, to me it was like, meh. Big deal, you know. It's kind of fun. Got a um, it's a lot of um, modeling here. This is, I don't know how long this is taking me to draw this. It's a uh, it's been a while, but I'm really enjoying it. So I loved all of the characters, you know, um, eventually, eventually, I liked the characters, like Jaime and all of that stuff. And, you know, um, Siegfried, eventually. When I first saw bits of it, when it first came on TV, um, I didn't get it. I, it didn't impress me as much because I was probably not aware of the just the sheer brilliance, the cleverness of Don Adams. I never saw it enough. But when it was in rerun, yep, that's when I became a passionate advocate for the show there was like a very big thing why did I make that black I don't like that okay all right accident accidental hap accidental thing happy accident maybe so 
So I'm going to keep some of these lines quite simple, no form on the jacket. Um, just try to keep it very simple now because I'm conscious of the details sometimes will run away. I want to concentrate the details only in the facial area, this area. Everything else will simplify. So remember the you know the, the mask zone so called is where the uh, we're gonna recognize if 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 I get the caricature if the likeness is there um, not convinced yet it may not happen but I'm enjoying the process um, okay you can see how slippery this brown pencil is the black pencil I have to press quite hard on in the paper to try to establish its dominance against the brown pencil so the black pencil has to have when you use it and you want to outline something like this like a pen you have to use it quite strong so in other words you have to press quite hard so some of these things we're going to repair a little bit better with the um, with a pen, uh, brush, black brush. Listen to the rain. So, um, and the music, I uh, can't remember who did the music, but I think it was, um, could it be Hugo Montenegro, maybe? The guy that did. Uh, some great 60s music, jazz music. It's a very iconic soundtrack. And an iconic beginning and ending with the doors to control headquarters, you know. a lot of fun. Well, look at the rain. It's pouring down here. Melbourne. Oh, well. So, um... What can I do? Let's get the black brush. This is a, a zig brush so that the ink is in the handle and you press it and it pumps out into the the brush itself. Right? So it gives you a more or less a continuous flow without having to recharge the brush by dipping it into ink. So I don't know whether I should do this or not, but I'll try. I'm trying to get um, build up the contrast um, of the blacks in the drawing. You should have some side levers because it makes subtly sense, I think, for that era. I think like all shows in that time it's they started out as a black and white show and then when they went into second season two you know if it was successful then they go into color and sometimes it would it would work and sometimes like Arguably lost in space. 
I didn't care for the colour. So the idea of this is to just create a thick and thin line and especially for contours, outer edges, it can help make the, the head or the character stand out a little bit better from the background. You also can um, extenuate the curvature of forms. The idea of it, of course, is to create a, a roundness. See, so thick and thin lines to give that to a um, an impression of a round, smooth surface. Okay, that'll do. Okay. That might work. All right, now I'm going to get this white pen here, and um, it's a acrylic pen. It's quite opaque. Right, it's a white pen, so I'm going to. I've taken the highlights, the reflected lights, out of his eyes. I'm putting them back in now. Like so. And then sort of build up a little bit of other reflections here and there. careful there. The, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm putting in shine, but I'm going to be careful about how much shine to put in. I need to make sure that it's, um, it's, it doesn't detract from everything else. Of course, the more white you use, the less shiny it becomes because it's sort of like you're then filling it out too much. Filling in the, um, shine a little bit too much. So I'm going to go also in here with the 
white pencil in a sec. I just want to help help out the, um, the contrasts a little bit. Some sharper highlights that I think would be good to play with. Remember, as I said to you before, there's this um, highlight coming down this side of the face, but we don't want to overdo that. So be careful with coloring in. Don't use it. For God's sake, don't use this. Don't use the white to color in. Be very sparing with your use of it because it can be a very, very overpowering. And if you overdo it, it will tend to take out the, the glossiness that you're trying to establish by flattening it out too much. It'll be just too much white. It just, it'll just wash and won't give you a, a nice um, contrast. So, we've got a few things. We've got a softer brush as well, but before we do that, I'm going to hit it with a white pencil. Um, I haven't decided what color to do the background on this either. I want to sort of cut it in. Um, I might use a white or black, I don't know. So again, don't color it in with a white pencil, right? Sort of use a uh, hatch line effect, you know? Parallel lines are the best sort of um, process for a lot of pencil. Yep. So that's what we should be looking for. Because it gives it more of a... a skin-like texture helps with that uh, organic look just a little bit so far so good now decision time what are we going to do with this area Let, let's let's leave it um, I don't know, make it lighter perhaps be careful, you have to be careful. Don't make it too light. There's also some shine coming in from the front, remember. We've got to establish that shine, shininess on the, the head. It gives it a round, nice round approach. So these are forms that are coming out and they catch more light. So um, forehead comes out like that. So this is where the light is catching on this area of the head, forehead, and this area of the, of the brow. Okay. So that's what's happening. So irrespective of what's happening with the light. Remember lights cancel out each other a lot of the time so you've got to be aware that you need to look um, and try to see what the forms, what the lights telling you about the form, the texture, etc. Oh, is it, there's, a def, there's a definite shadow. There's a definite shadow here. From the brow. Okay, remember what I said about that light. Okay, obey the light, right? So I ignored that and I've actually created something that doesn't make sense. That's a bit better. Yeah, so now it's, it's 
gelling a little bit nicer. Good. We'll continue on. Lower lid, reflective. The bags under the eyes can pick up a little bit of shine. Uh, don't forget that cheekbone, even though it's not there in the photo. If you put it there, it makes sense. Why am I talking in this sing-song voice? I don't know. So, um, let's, let's talk more about Don Adams. And um, I just loved the show. It was, you know, when I, when I saw it again in repeat, it was on all the time. And um, in the end, I just couldn't get enough of it. It was just really, really funny and clever. And, you know, um, there's a thing about corny jokes. They work if the setup is appropriate. So a lot of the jokes are corny. Um, so it depends on the setup. You know, corny jokes tend to work because they're exaggerated and we we look at it and if it's if it's appropriate in the setup if it's you know like it's almost if you have an exaggerated premise if you have exaggerated build up then the joke will work better um, for example in cartoons cartoons are the only place that I know of where puns work and it's true of animated cartoons and it's also true of gag cartoons so single page single panel or three panel four panel gags so build up build up build up gag right and it and and pun a uh, pun and they just work because i think the format allows for that build up allows for that exaggerated build up of tension and even though that you can feel where the joke has to go, um, nevertheless, it still works. I don't think anyone's really explained that. I think it's got something to do with the storytelling method and the investment in the characters, in, in, this, in the, the visual narrative part to help it. So if you look at Bugs Bunny show, for example, the gags are really, really corny. They would not work in a live action context. Um, lost a bit of tone here for some reason. I don't know why. Um, of course, the light, the light works best next to dark, right? In doing a, a tonal drawing. And the opposite is also true. So dark works best next to light. So, this is why I'm doing this. So, here we go. Okay, that'll do. So, um, yeah, the, um, the gags in Get Smart were very corny, but the setup was was impossibly theatrical, impossibly exaggerated. So that's why the humor worked. I don't know why it, I just don't know why it did. Um, there's a softness here from the makeup. This is why I'm not doing a harsh highlight on that side. Um, I don't know why it worked that way. It just did. There's something about, you know, the comedy writing that um, was able to employ that level of of um, shtick, that level of of humour.
So, yeah, so it was very, uh, you know, I mean, to me, the perfect viewing experience would be one third Get Smart, one third Bugs Bunny, one third Three Stooges. There you go. That's for me. You know, the stylization and exaggeration, the style of humor, the use of, of comedy puns, double entendre, whatever, physical humor, um, you know. It just, uh, it just worked. And, um, and that, that, I mean, that could be just me. That could just be my, what I liked. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, this whole thing is because today because um, you know I just want to feel happy and there's enough misery in the situation at the moment and whenever I think of get smart I have to laugh we have to you know enjoy it Don Adams It's one of those things where, you know, you never really know um, how big an impression someone has made in your life. And that's true of this, um, for sure. Uh, no question. You know, he's made a big impression on my life. And um, I don't think about him every single day. But when I do, it makes me happy. And I think, I think that's, I mean, what more can, you know, you're a comedian, what more do you want out of people, really? It's, um, he is a lot of value. He's a lot of value. He's a very clever, you know, sure, they're stylized, you know, for humor and the delivery. Very stylized. This is another brush pen, if I can get it to work. Um, so, whereas the others were point, this is a brush. So, what that means is it can go thick and thin, it has opaqueness about it. So, we're going to try to create a, uh, some contrasts, which will help pop some of these elements a little bit, hopefully. I think I might go and watch some Get Smart. Um, repair some of my mojo. I'm usually quite a positive person. Today was sort of almost the opposite. Became very depressed. There's a lot of crazy things happening in the world and also in Melbourne and uh, you know this is my way of coping this is Don Adams is my coping mechanism so there you go some you know hey it's, if it works it works that's it kind of nice. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get this... Uh, I've got a better white pen. I think I might have a... That's thicker. Let's go. That's good. So this is a paint marker. I'm going to lean on this, this uh, drawing and I am going to fill in the negative space around Don Adams 
to create a contrast between Don Adams and not Don Adams. So the foreground and the background. And I'm using a emulating the pencil hatch lines rather than filling them in because if you fill it in it's not going to get smooth so it may be very distracting so may as well have a texture where I'm in full control and something that I'm not in control of so looks like it's on purpose doesn't it when you do this it's a decorative approach like a basket weave one of the cross hatching techniques is a, a thing is actually quite I think it's quite decorative it does provide tone but it's what you call a a um, basket weave effect which I'll show you in a second um, depending on you know what the subject is I guess and your approach That's, that'll work um, let me just finish this and I'll, I'll explain the texture for some reason they they had they had regular characters but you know I think they went for like six years um, get smart so they had regular characters of course they, they came up with new ones like Jaime who's the robot which at first I, I didn't quite like it was a bit silly just having an actor act like a robot doesn't make a robot take that six million dollar man or Yul Brynner or even Westworld I guess in the end although I did I did enjoy the current season of Westworld I thought that was probably better than the movie so um, let me just do this just finish him off down here make sure that how am I going with the spelling yep 1D good I messed up with um, Carolyn Jones I called her Caroline Jones the other day all right so um, just before I go I'll just do this if you're looking for a crosshatch uh, technique so this is hatch right you can use it for pencils anything pens this is crosshatch and you can get go berserk and go crosshatch and crosshatch there are actually different angles of lines parallel lines there's also stippling which is hard to do with a pencil line um, what else is there oh the, the one I wanted to tell you was this sort of like a, a decorative approach to hatch lines you can explore that another day depending on the subject of course and you know it's a, like it looks like a basket weave type of thing but can be quite effective all right so um, where is he I've lost his there he is that's my Don Adams uh, oh, that's the before Don Adams this is the after Don Adams. This is my Don Adams. This is uh, Franz Cantor saying, I will catch you on the flip side. Bye-bye.